So hi, this is Gerard Dache. I'm the executive director of the Government Blockchain Association. Uh, welcome to uh, our uh, our event on uh, blockchain and elections. Uh, we've got a, a, a powerhouse uh, panel today and um, a, a bunch of folks with us. So I'm going to start off with Amelia Powers Gardner. Let her introduce herself. We'll have a, a brief conversation and then we'll start bringing in some of the other panelists into the conversation. So Amelia, would you like to just say a few words about your background and yeah. um, and then let's get started. So Amelia Powers Gardner, I'm the Utah County Clerk Auditor and I'm an elections official. I'm also an elected official. So this is an elected office that I sit in and I run the elections in Utah County, Utah. Um, today's panel I'm really excited about. We've got people that talk about accessibility and access to voting and how blockchain can help solve that. We've got people to talk about security and how blockchain actually helps improve the security of our existing elections system. Um, we've got experts from actual blockchain solutions, vendors that utilize the technology, and, uh, and a few other folks that, that are, we're going to talk to around this idea of e-voting and mobile voting and how blockchain can help improve elections processes, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. Awesome. And then I, I know you and I have put together a, a brief little uh, uh, outline before we started. I do want to say when we talk about uh, security, we've got Eugene um, Morosov uh, with us. So we'll, we'll include him on the conversation about security. And he's doing some work with regard to, uh, uh, you know, some of the recent publications about security. But we'll, we'll get to that, to that in a minute. So um, why don't you and I start off? Uh, um, the, the floor is yours on, on the first topic. So I think the first topic, we were going to have um, a discussion on the scope of the 2020 election. And in the elections world in the United States, innovation typically only happens when there's a catalyst. Election administrators and election officials throughout the country don't like to make any changes. And you can understand that when you're, when you're dealing with something as critical and high stakes as elections, if they don't see a need to update or change something, they don't. Uh, we, the last time we had a major change in elections in the United States was 20 years ago in the 2000 presidential election between Al Gore and George Bush. And that election ended up in the Supreme Court. And that was the when the term hanging Chad was really entered all of our vernaculars. And if you think about it, in the last 20 years, we have gotten smartphones, GPS technology, um, phones with cameras on them. None of these things existed prior to that. So if you look at how far the world of technology has come in the last two decades, and you think that our election system has really not seen any updates since that, except for two decades, you wonder why. Well, the reason why is because there hasn't been a major catalyst. And in my opinion, as an election official, I think 2020 is a catalyst like 2000 was where um, we have a presidential election that is mired in the courts. And we have a lot of people that felt disenfranchised. Um, we did have incredible voter turnout, once in a lifetime levels of voter turnout, which is fantastic. But a lot of those processes that allowed that were just riddled with with issues, with chaos. So I think we're really at, at an ideal time. We've also gotten to a place as a society where we no longer accept failure in, in certain areas. So for example, in the past, if a person had a disability and they couldn't make it to the polling locations or they couldn't fill out a paper ballot that was mailed to them, people just kind of threw up their hands and said, oh, well, they don't get to vote. Or if we had somebody that had housing insecurity and they didn't have a permanent address, we just kind of threw up our hands and said, oh, well, they don't get to vote. But we live in a society today where disenfranchising someone because of a disability or a socioeconomic downturn is no longer acceptable to us as a society. And we have to find a way for every person to have the opportunity to vote if they're eligible. 
And then you couple that with the advances that we've had in technology and this hyper excitement about the political process within our society. And I think that we have all of the makings of the catalyst that is needed to move voting into the 21st century, because it has been stuck in the 20th century for long enough. Uh, I don't know if, uh, Gerard, if you wanted to comment on that, but as we look at the landscape of what is the voting world right now, I really think 2020 highlights that a change is needed. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would also characterize it this way, and it, it sort of dovetails on what you're saying. You know, when we set up our systems a long time ago, right, we set up our systems such that we needed people to represent ourselves. We needed to trust people and entities. And for whatever reason, I think that there was a degree of trust that um, I think in 2020 is just not there anymore, right? Um, so we all vote, we go through a process, and, and that process is designed to, to build in trust. We're supposed to have people from both sides. There's supposed to be all kinds of checks and balances. But for whatever reason, right, um, there is a, there's, that, that trust is broken. And, and what we're talking about is just counting votes, right? It, we're, we're just talking about counting stuff, right? right? This isn't philosophy, right? It's not, it's, it's math. And, and what happened in 2000, uh, well, the, 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 the late early, the late 80s, the early 90s, and then 2008, right, with this concept of, a, a, a blockchain and, and Bitcoin, right? And saying, look, we don't have to trust the banks. We don't have to trust the central authority. We now have a mechanism where we can we can now, look, we're talking, again, we're talking about counting. Why is it that we all give our votes to a, a small number of people? And we could say, hey, you know, one's got an R after their name, one's got a D after their name. But we give our, 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 our votes to a small number of people and then they get to tell us who won, right? And and so my understanding, and, I, and I'm not a voting uh, expert, but my understanding is that there's a small number of, of companies, right, that that commercially, that, that build the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. and, um, and a lot of people ask the question, with that much power, with the power of deciding national elections and who gets to spend literally trillions of dollars Right, with that being in the hands of a small number of people, I, I just think that um, we ought to ask ourselves: Are the, are there ways to bring more transparency into that so that more people can have have trust? And I think that these issues are tough. There's all kinds of legal and regulatory issues. There's there's technical issues. Right, that this is not an easy conversation. But I'm hoping that in the in the elections in the future, we won't have as many people saying, "No, I don't believe you." Right. right. That's the thing. If we could get on the other side of that, I think we, we would have huge, huge uh, attraction. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that we when we talk about advancing elections and we talk about advancing the technology, um, of course, the big topic comes up on security. And um, I think that when we look at, in fact, Larry, who's on this call, he sent me a an article that he wrote on election day, and it was a fantastic article. I don't know, Gerard, if you are okay, um, if we just include him on this on this topic real quick, if you wanna unmute Larry, because I'd yeah. love to ask Larry about this. I know you're gonna be talking about accessibility later, but right now I wanna talk a little bit about the article that you wrote that, that I read yesterday. And you talked about how um, security experts or cybersecurity experts when they talk about the cybersecurity of elections, and we'll go into the details of security later, but Larry, you started um, an election company, one of the most recent election companies uh, called Clear Ballot. So you understand the election world. And your article wasn't written from the point of view of a cybersecurity expert. It was written in from the point of view as an elections expert. And I really loved how you talked about that cybersecurity experts look at elections in a vacuum and they say, well, cybersecurity isn't actually secure, so we can't use it in our elections. And your point was no way of running an election is 100% secure. So I want to kind of tee you up by saying, you know, it's 
It's common knowledge in the election world that former President Lyndon B. Johnson stole his Senate election. They found out two years after he was elected that they had stuffed the ballot boxes with paper ballots. But he was already a senator, so they left him sitting in office, and then he ended up the vice president and then the president. And so when, when I hear cybersecurity experts say we have to use paper at the polls on election day because it's the only thing that's secure, I can't help but laugh because we have proof that paper at the polls on election day has stolen elections, right? So as an election expert, do you want to talk maybe a little bit about um, this idea of moving into a, a technology era with elections and how that compares to what we have today? And, and one thing real quick, Larry, before we get started, um, Amelia, I also have uh, Eugene with us. Eugene um, has got to leave a little bit early because he's got to, uh, he's got another commitment he's got to take care of. So uh, Larry, I'd love for you to address it. And then after that, Amelia, and I'm throwing a little bit of a monkey wrench into your, into your plan, I'm sorry. Can we then have Eugene maybe talk, talk a little bit of, about security and, and then, then we'll come back to accessibility at, after that. Is that okay with you? Yeah, I think that sounds great. If that's okay with you, Larry, if we can, Talk about this and then Eugene can do security and then we'll head to accessibility. I'm fine with that. Good. Um, so thanks for the introduction, Amelia. And um, uh, I've gotten quite a few good comments on the, the article I posted on on LinkedIn, on my LinkedIn page on um, uh, the afternoon of election day before the polls had closed. And um, so let me sort of pick up the thread that you you asked me to and, and but start off by saying that um, as kind of a practitioner in this space for the last dozen years, um, I think we've got the notion of security all wrong. And we, we talk about security as though it is a destination that a system is either secure or it is not. And I think if we reflect carefully, even just a little bit, we would notice, we would know that security is a continuum. Uh, it is a journey and not a destination. And, I use a good example. I get, use an, ex an analogy that says, you know, the, if if the quest is always for a bigger, stronger padlock, there will always be someone that comes along with a bigger, stronger bolt cutter. And so, state of the art in security is really not these days around, you know, putting a padlock on the system, but it is to surround the affected. Um, uh, the affected area, in this case elections, with surveillance. You know, can we know when something has intruded and ideally detect it, uh, analyze it and and correct for it in near real time? That is the that is the state of the art that we should be at. So it's really resilience that we should be talking about and not security. And and here is the proof. Uh, that no system can claim to be secure against an unknown threat by definition. So um, where I am right now in my, uh, in my little personal odyssey is to try to educate policymakers on the need for a, an ongoing process to get to higher levels of security and trust. And really, trust is the uh, the big thing these days in election. And um, I'll take issue with you, uh, Gerard, on uh, it's only counting votes. That's that would be um, a really narrow view of what we in the election industry go through. Uh, the, the the much more difficult problem is building trust, and we've seen an assault on the trustworthiness of the elections in this lesson, in this current administration, that is terrible. Uh, and that's all I will say about uh, uh, about that. But um, and so um, and I'll just leave it at this, and we can come back to it when um, uh, the next person uh, talks about security. Um, I started uh, Clear Ballot with a um, an idea around trust, and we introduced a visual method of looking at the aggregate vote in a way that uh, the state of Maryland, uh, the state of Florida, New York State, Vermont, and, and, and a few others are using to do um, audits. And in Florida next year, they'll use the, techno the visual technology to resolve close elections. And you can use this visual technology in a matter of minutes 
to resolve an election a contest that's close, even with one vote difference, in a matter of less than an hour. Um, so there's all kinds of, and, and I see blockchain technology as a really important tool to not only secure the aggregate vote, but to secure the transactions that made up that vote, as well as the voter registration system, um, so that we can uh, have a stable, um, a, 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 a stable data set upon which to conduct a, a realistic and rigorous audit. So let me stop there. Thank you. I think that was that was great. I think you really, you know, brought into perspective that this is an ever changing dynamic and this will be a constant issue. There is no such thing as complete security and it's a spectrum. And as long as we can keep that on the more secure side of the spectrum, whether we're dealing with paper ballots or electronic ballots, we're facing the same issues and we have the same challenges and our goal is to mitigate them and record any changes possible. So I think that was perfect. Thank you, Larry. So Gerard, awesome. did you want to introduce Eugene? Yeah, uh, Eugene, uh, why don't you go ahead and un unmute yourself? And uh, so Eugene is a, a GBA member. He's with uh, actually two organizations, Ton Labs and uh, the Free Ton Community, which represents uh, uh, an organization of over 8,000 developers on a, on a free and open decentralized uh, blockchain space. And, uh, and he's been doing some work with our good friend Carlos down in um, uh, Guatemala. Um, so so uh, Eugene, if you can unmute yourself, we'd love to hear about uh, a little bit about what you're doing with the folks down in Guatemala and your perspective. I know you're also uh, looking at some security issues um, and uh, have an interesting announcement. So by all means, please, please share with us. And you are still on mute. There yes, you go. you're unmuted, perfect. Hello and uh, thank you everyone. Uh, Gerard, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I would like to, uh, first of all, a couple of words about myself. I'm a financial professional, I'm a CPA, and I've been working with uh, various uh, blockchain uh, aspects for about uh, four years now, of which about a year I'm with uh, Tone Labs, a core developer of uh, software for the Freeton uh, blockchain and Freeton community. So um, we've been actively uh, cooperating with GBA on a number of issues, two of which I'd like to highlight today because they're directly relevant to the voting subject that we are discussing. So number one, as Gerard mentioned uh, a few months ago, we got together with Carlos Toriello, uh, leader of um, a Guatemalan company Fiscal Digital, which is uh, widely recognized in the country as an independent observer of elections. And so uh, Carlos was in need of uh, certain improvements in the system that he designed, uh, specifically uh, targeting, uh, providing independent uh, and fair audit for the uh, actual elections. And so uh, what we did at uh, Freeton, we uh, put together a use case uh, describing the specific needs that Carlos uh, was expecting to have uh, to make uh, voter voting audits uh, fair, transparent, and, and immutable. Um, and we put together a contest. The way Freeton community works is that any, anyone can come up with a contest proposal. It is then discussed by community members. And if there is a wide support, which we clearly saw in this particular case, then uh, the community award, uh, 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 establishes certain funds to be given as rewards to people who would submit the best solution. I would refer you to the chat. I put uh, two links in the chat together and I would like to briefly go over uh, both links because they really highlight what we're doing right now. So, um, Gerard, can I uh, share my screen? Yeah. All right, can everybody see my screen? Gerard? 
Can you see my screen? Yes, indeed. All right. So uh, what we have done is we uh, put together a contest, which we called Crowdsource Voting Audit Solutions for Latin American Elections. The uh, contest was run for about um, uh, three weeks, and it just ended yesterday. And as a result, what we received is 20 different proposals from various people. All of those submissions, which you see on the screen right now, and let me just go to one and see what it looks like as an example. Uh, those people submitted their proposals and they are competing for rewards that were established by a community collectively close to uh, 100,000 ton crystals, which is at the current rate roughly $100,000. So that's a very substantial uh, financial pool available to winners and the best submitters of the contest results. So um, just to illustrate, uh, here's one submission uh, that we received, uh, and it's uh, very, very detailed. So there are about 20 of those right now, which Carlos, Gerard, and jury members of Freeton will go through, analyze them, and then award uh, certain amounts uh, according to the prizes, uh, a reward schedule to contest participants. So this is the mechanism that we're using. Anybody can submit their um, contest to the community. If community believes that this is really relevant and important, they allocate rewards. And then members of Freeton, which by the way, all of you can join, uh, it's free and open to anyone, uh, would submit their proposal, submit their solutions. The jury then will analyze them. And again, the jury will consist of uh, people that really understand what we're talking about. Uh, there will be opportunity for anyone to post comments and to reflect their own opinions about any submission. So this is a very much a live uh, process which is taking place right now as we speak. And then the best solutions, including opinion of Carlos himself, and by the way, I think he submitted his own, which is wonderful. Uh, the best will be voted on and rewards will be established and we will have a solution. So this is one area how Freeton works, and I certainly encourage anyone to come to the community with their own some issues that require solutions. Uh, we will help uh, as uh, Ton Labs is a member of Freeton, and we are well positioned to uh, assist people in preparing use cases for community consideration. So this is one topic I was hoping to discuss. I think it's very exciting, and we're looking forward to working with uh, Guatemala enthusiasts to see if we can really implement it. And it is certainly relevant to other jurisdictions that uh, may wish to take a look at uh, what uh, type of solutions blockchain can bring, okay? So this is uh, briefly about the Guatemala situation. And the next thing I wanted to uh, briefly discuss uh, is the document which you see right now, and this is the second link that I shared in the chat. Um, essentially what we've learned uh, is that on um, uh, November 6th, a group of MIT and Harvard uh, professors and researchers published uh, a paper called Going from Bad to Worse from Internet Voting to Blockchain Voting. Now, we, we just couldn't let it stand. We believe that we um, as a community must react to that. And so what is happening right now is I put together this uh, contest draft, which again, everyone is welcome to look through. It's the second link in my uh, post in chat and um, help us improve and fine tune this document. But essentially it is geared towards the community uh, resources uh, uh, being available to properly respond to what the um, MIT and Harvard researchers are essentially saying. I'd like to take a couple of minutes, literally, just to walk you through the uh, concept which is behind this contest. So basically what we do is we put together a problem description, a use case, so to say, and we establish some dates for the community to look at it. So right now, as you can see, uh, submission will start on December 14 and go through December 28, and then there will be a voting cycle uh, by jurors uh, of the community to decide which solution, uh, which answer, which essay, so to say, will be the best. I provide a, a short background and description of the actual problem. 
essentially, the uh, publication says that the blockchain is no good and uh, it cannot be used by elections because it brings a whole bunch of problems and issues which um, you know nobody wants to deal with. And essentially, um, what they're saying can be summarized in one sentence uh, present in one of the attachments to their publication. They basically say um, that um, uh, inability of any internet-based system to allow for fair political elections is an established science, quote unquote. Well, when we saw that, we clearly thought that this is very reminiscent of uh, the fact that before Nicholas Copernicus published his wonderful work in 1543, the established science was that the earth was flat. And so we think that the situation today, you know, resembles that one very closely. So I think it's time that we prove them wrong. So what I wrote in this uh, contest proposal is uh, certain general requirements for the responses. There are two that must be in every submission, which is basically to disprove the key points in MIT paper. And then we are also asking for people to actually describe a possible solution that will address all of the issues brought up by MIT and Harvard um, so that the community can take a look at what can actually be done. Uh, there are also some specific requirements for this submission which stem directly from um, the paper itself and you can see them here. Uh, we are um, assigning additional awards, additional rewards for details addressing every single item in the MIT paper. We then um, assign certain evaluation criteria and weights to help uh, jury uh, better define their uh, votes, to better explain their votes. So we assign weights to every component of the response. And then here are the rewards. For example, whoever submits the best paper will get uh, 10,000 tons. Uh, again, at today's exchange rate, that's about $10,000. And uh, there are a total of 20 prizes that uh, um, I'm asking the community to allocate. There will be a follow-up, Gerard, and this deals directly with the GBA. Once uh, the submissions are received, uh, GBA will be one of the um, auditors of the possible solution. We will ask you and uh, Carlos and Amelia and everybody else, of course, to um, present their views as to whether uh, the proposals put forward are actually addressing uh, properly the MIT paper. So there'll be a, a way for, for GBA community to contribute as well. Um, uh, I described the voting process, the jury rewards. We reward people for participating in uh, such contests in the jury capacities. Uh, there are certain procedural requirements and requests for the paper for the format, et cetera. Uh, there's a specific prohibition of multiple submissions or uh, copycatting from other um, submitters, okay? And then the last is a disclaimer. Uh, until Freeton is fully decentralized, uh, we cannot um, distribute tokens to US citizens. I am gladly reporting to you that this restriction will be removed uh, approximately in two weeks from today when Freeton goes fully decentralized and uh, no single entity or company would have uh, defining uh, capability in the network. Okay, Gerard, that's uh, my- uh, That's awesome. Uh, Eugene, I got, I got uh, uh, two questions and a comment. So the, uh, first of all, the, the comment, a number of people said they can't see the, um, uh, the links in the chat. If you could uh, put those links back in the chat, maybe you send it to an individual as opposed to everyone. Yeah, but uh, yep. do that right now. And then do me a favor when you do it, do it as two separate entries. Cause sometimes when you put two links together that they don't actually. So just identify the, the first link uh, and then a second chapter. Um, what's the total, what's the total number of the reward for, uh, uh, for the, the total contest here? Well, uh, let's see. So this is um, the total reward. So we've got, um, um, Let's see, um, that's 50 plus. Uh, so we're talking close to 100,000 tons, which is roughly $100,000 at current going rate. And, okay. And then my second question is, what's the approximate size of community 
right? That that essentially is going to be uh, have access to this because you know when a position is, when a paper is put together, one of the things that we we they carry a lot of weight are the credentials, right, or, or the process by which it, it comes through. So a community based paper that has a wider community has a little bit more weight sometimes than a than a, you know something from Joe's uh, Bar and Grill. So how would you describe the the credibility of the community that potentially is putting this paper together? Yeah, that's a great, uh, great question, Gerard. Um, and uh, let me answer it in the following way. At the moment, the uh, Freeton uh, community is uh, roughly 35,000 members, of which, as you mentioned, uh, just over 8,000 are professional developers. And this, those both numbers are growing every day as the community becomes larger. So, but again, at the moment, uh, we have, let's say 35,000 people from a couple of dozen countries. So we believe it's uh, quite wide, but we would certainly welcome uh, GBA sharing this information with all of its members or whoever else wants to participate. This is free and open to anyone to participate. So this very fact that, that this is open to anyone to join um, is, is a good factor. We believe we will have enough uh, people participating. For example, uh, on the Guatemala, as we saw, uh, there are 20 people uh, with submissions. So it's quite yeah. rough. But we welcome That's everyone else. So, so we didn't really necessarily cover specifically what the cybersecurity um, uh, threats and sort of counterpoints are in, in this piece. But what, what we what we wanted to share with everybody is that there are a number of cybersecurity concerns, right? I think, you know, look at MIT and Harvard, they're smart people, right? Uh, and, and, and I believe whether we're talking about this last election or this MIT uh, Harvard thing, there's two sides to every story and we ought, we ought to give adequate uh, review and approval and response as opposed to just shutting, shutting them down. And I, and I appreciate this. So over, uh, Amelia, you and I will have to, and Susan, um, you and I will have to talk about um, how we want to work with this and, and, and engage in the cybersecurity working groups. So once these responses come back in, they can be properly voted on and, um, uh, and, 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 and communicated. I'd like to add that, Gerard, if I may quickly. So one of the requirements in this particular contest, uh, I highlighted it now, uh, is to address you know, private key security loss issues and how to prevent fix them, as well as other things specifically mentioned in the MIT paper in sort of the security domain. So the answer very much must include responding to those threats as well. So any security experts are most welcome to join and share their thoughts as well. Excellent, excellent. All right, uh, I'm, really, so I'm, I'm afraid that I may have throwing you a little bit of a monkey wrench, but, but what do you think about all this and uh, what, what are your thoughts? I, I love this. You know, it's so interesting to me as an election administrator, when I have um, computer science graduate students at MIT who know nothing about how to run an election telling me that blockchain voting is worse than what we currently have. And when I call those folks, and I've literally talked to them on the phone, and I say, okay, so what's your solution? And they say, paper at the polls on election day. And I say, okay, so US Senate races have been stolen at the polls on election day. So what's your solution? And they say, well, paper at the polls on election day. And I say, okay, so what about a blind person? Oh, well, I don't know. What about someone who lives overseas? Well, I don't know. So then I ask them, well, what do you think is the least secure part of our current elections? I don't know. So what do you think of our current vendors that we use? Well, I don't know. And so it's interesting to me that, we, that we're getting um, solutions from graduate students that know nothing about elections and we, and we call them experts. And I love the, the idea that we can get a reply to this paper uh, that, is an, that is an open call for replies like this because um, you know, I think we have, for example, Larry on this call. Larry understands cybersecurity and he's an elections expert. And I would love for Larry to come, you know, to give us some, some answers. Part of the problem with the, all, any of the replies to this are the same problem that we have with the people who created this. And that's that they live in their own vacuum. And I think there are some things on this list 
that of, of quote unquote security issues that I as an election official will have the best answer to. And I think there are some things on this list that a cybersecurity expert will have the best answer to. So I think utilizing a method like this where we're crowdsourcing knowledge in response to this is probably how we're gonna come up with the best reply. So I love the idea. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hey, uh, Ron, I wanna hear from you, uh, uh, Ron Millo and also Larry. Um, Ron, why don't you go ahead and, and, and say a couple words and then, uh, then Larry, I wanna hear from you. And so I'll, I'll go ahead and unmute you, Larry, as soon as I can find the right control. And Ron, you'll have to un unmute yourself as well. We could probably stop screen sharing, Eugene, now if you want to. Oh. <clears throat> Got Unless it. we okay. have something else you wanted to show us. All right. Thank you. All right, so Larry, Larry is, you can unmute yourself, Larry, and Ron, you should be able to unmute yourself. Ron cannot unmute himself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it so that people can unmute themselves. So I'm, I'm going to ask, unless you've been called out specifically, uh, please do not unmute yourself. Uh, I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to Eugene. Um, I'd like to connect with you, Eugene. I'm really excited about this. Sure, I need to talk to Larry. Man. I've known I've known all of these guys for a dozen years or more. Uh, Ron Rivest, especially, and I applaud this effort, um, and I believe the successful response will be a combination of security-related topics as well as policy-related topics. And I especially resonated with your analogy about uh, uh, we would never have had a Copernican revolution if. <laughs> if this kind of thinking. Um, I would urge you to, uh, to Google verified voting and Puerto Rico and look at the first paragraph of the letter to the governor that Ron Rivest, among other computer scientists, and they use the term, it is settled science that internet voting is, quote, inherently insecure. What nonsense. Yeah, well, yeah. It's settled science that paper at the polls on election day is inherently insecure. It's yeah. settled science that vote by mail is inherently insecure. It's mm -hmm. settled science that having people overseas use email or fax machine to vote is yeah. insecure. So, so I think that statement is is completely. What is the deadline on this paper? I, I got a, um, a request. Uh, I believe it's December ninth. I believe it's December nineteenth. No, we, we, we're not. We haven't uh, published to the community. Oh, right, right, right. Yes, yes. It'll be up. Um, why don't we all, um, everybody, just sort of toss their LinkedIn information into the chats, and then we can um, we can all connect. I tossed mine at the top. Let, let me introduce uh, Ron, Ron uh, yeah. Miller for a second. So Ron works with Eugene uh, in in the the whole time uh, space, and again, uh, uh, they are a GBA uh, organizational member. And I, I will say one thing about GBA, and, and we, we, are, we are a membership organization, we're a business group, so our, you're going to find that we promote uh, GBA members. So uh, Votes is a member, Ton is a member, and there's a lot of other folks that are doing things outside of uh, our organization, and it's just not our, it, you know, we're not, we're not a 501c3 uh, a cause-driven organization, we're essentially a membership-driven organization. Um, but I got to tell you that the the Tom community has been fantastic, and they're actually working on building solutions in in the healthcare space and the election space, and and ideally, uh, we'll have them involved in many different uh, working groups. Uh, I know um, Mark Wasser's on the call with us; he's our CTO, and um, um, and these guys really have a have a lot of great stuff to say. Ron, did you want to make a comment real quick, and then we got I got to turn it back. Yeah, really quickly. Yeah, I'm sorry because I know there's an agenda. I just wanted to add what, to what Eugene was saying about the contest, both for first for the Guatemala voting system and or auditing system, I should say, and for the MIT paper, um, uh, or actually specifically for the MIT uh, uh, disassemblement. I will call it that. Is that MIT has the opportunity to come and try to retort. So there will be a, a, a reciprocal contest should they choose to participate that will give them the opportunity to retort what has been you know, uh, 
dismantled or disassembled um, uh, to them. And, and that really underscores what Freeton is actually about. I'm not trying to, uh, I work for Ton Labs, which is a software company. Freeton is a community. So there is no company, there's no entity. Uh, there's no, uh, it was never financed by anything. It's uh, everything is merit based on contests and proposals. So anybody is welcome to come and uh, argue anything uh, openly. And uh, there are lots of professionals and then there are lots of people who are emotional. Uh, and I think that's part of the community and community building, which we actually uh, put into a sort of a, um, decentralized governance where we uh, create sub governance groups, each of which is professional in their own right. So somebody knows how to do social media marketing. Somebody knows how to do public relations. Somebody knows how to do, how to develop. Somebody knows DevOps, uh, all kinds of technical stuff that I'm not going to get into. And they all sort of culminate in uh, their own groups, make a proposal to ask for tokens, tons, ton crystals, which then get approved by the same community, not by that community, by the, the global community, so to speak, and decide, yes, this is worth it or it isn't. And then they, those tokens are allocated based on that merit, then they go to work pro, uh, providing KPIs. As those KPIs are achieved, they ask for more tokens and more tokens and more, more tokens. We call it stratified governance, essentially, uh, where there is no central hey, authority. Hey, Ron, let me... Let me um... Let me wrap it up here because we are really, we're really. Sure, trying. absolutely. Just, I just wanted to say about the the um, uh, Guatemala thing uh, about the the voting. So basically, people are going to come. They're going to submit their their uh, uh, their expertise, and then it'll be evaluated by everybody. And maybe they won't have a solution, and that's fine. Um, and same goes for the MIT thing. Um, it's not a one way street. MIT will have a, a chance to retort, but the idea is to bring the best minds together and bring the best ideas together in a community. So that's all, that's all I wanted to add. Thank you, Gerard, for the uh, you, for the moment. You bet, and I, I want, the one other thing that I'd, I'd like to mention real quick is um, these, these groups of communities, we're also connecting to the government business blockchain platform and creating ecosystems, right? So for example, and we'll get to, we'll get to Giles here in a minute. Um, if you have a product or solution that may focus on voter roles or may focus on, uh, you know, accounting or auditing or whatever, right? We are all part of a community. There's no one business or company or entity that does it all, right? So if we come together and create these ecosystems of interacting uh, systems, Freetown community, and we have other communities like, like Freetown that, that will be coming on board, right? That it's important for us to be able to work together to create these ecosystems at, at, as a community. Um, Amelia, uh, you know, Steve Olson is not um, available to, um, uh, to be part of the panelists. So I've, I got Giles uh, from Paris to, to join us. So when we get to that that part, let's uh, let's introduce Giles and and, uh, and have that part of the conversation. Let's move now into uh, the accessibility part of this conversation. As we did our introduction to the to the panel and talked about the 2020 election, one of the things that I talked about is the fact that our society today no longer accepts that we just leave behind people because of their socioeconomic status or because of their inability to mark a paper ballot. Um, I know that in this last election in the United States, there were large issues with access to the ballot for, um, for indigenous peoples living on reservations. And I, I myself am a dual citizen, I'm a US and Canadian. And when I lived in Canada, I know that there was a big issue with remote communities and their access to the ballot. And so we brought in, today I wanted to have Larry Moore talk to us about accessibility and how uh, there's large swaths of populations, whether they be rural, uh, whether it's based on their culture or a physical disability, or because they're serving in the military overseas that don't have access or reliable access to the ballot and how that affects us as a society and how that's no longer acceptable. So, and how blockchain could help solve that problem. Um, Larry, do you wanna? Yeah, let me, let me am I unmuted? Yeah. Yeah, I, you are unmuted. Um, so um, I belong to, and, and like um, the, uh, the town organization, uh, there's no central um, command and control structure. It's a, it's a, uh, a loose 
coalition of disability rights, veterans rights and civil rights organizations that have come together um, to exercise their voice on the, among other things, the topic of, of electronic voting. And um, uh, we will be making policy recommendations to Congress and the states. And it's very interesting to be affiliated with a group of people who walk with big sticks. Uh, they are, some of the members of this coalition are highly litigious. Um, they have a very impressive track record of coercing or calcifying states to uh, their will. Um, so, um, but in answer to um, uh, Amelia's uh, toss to me, um, the, the disability community is not a single community. There are numerous disabilities. And if you think about it, um, uh, they are permanent or they are temporary. And there's really not much difference between a person who is permanently confined to a wheelchair uh, or a, a young mother who has broken her leg and on election day cannot get to the polls in any other way. And so um, one of the things I applauded Amelia for was her leadership in the state uh, in the primary where she got in, but I think it was removed, um, the ability for caretakers of the disability community of dis disabled citizens to uh, vote in the same way. So um, the, um, the what I so I could talk on and on. There is a study that is uh, ongoing as we speak, um, conducted by two researchers, two well qualified researchers out of Rutgers University, uh, a, a large scale study covering. Um, about 3,000 individuals broken up two thirds, one third between disability and able bodied citizens as to how their, as to what their experience was in the 2020 election. And that study was funded by the Election Assistance Commission in um, uh, to add a set of data points to a previous study conducted 12 years ago. So not only there, there will be a longitudinal uh, aspect to this, uh, but a, um, an in-depth look at the 2020 election as it affected uh, people with disabilities. And um, what I, uh, the, the results are not in yet. They will be in uh, preliminary at the end of the month and begin to be published in early January in time for the 117th Congress. So um, uh, what is emerging is when you look at the definition of disability, right now it has been imposed by the state. And I use that sort of broadly speaking, not just a, a state, but um, there's a, there was a recent suit filed by the uh, uh, chapter of the American Council for the Blind against the uh, state of Indiana, where the, there were such odious requirements on the part of, dis of people with disabilities you had to go in person for an interview. Uh, they got to, you know, some bureaucrat got to decide whether or not you were uh, disabled enough to require special assistance. That all needs to disappear um, nationally. The idea that a dis the disability can be defined by the state needs to disappear as well. The notion of disability should be defined at the moment by the individual. And that leads, that's a, there's a number of implications for that, uh, of that. Uh, one of which the most powerful is, is that we will wind up um, advocating for all citizens and not just people with disabilities. Because at the end of the day, you, can't, you cannot really define the term disability in a non-inclusive state. You know, Larry, that's interesting. I, I'll talk in a little bit about the, the pilot that I'm currently trying to get past to the legislature here in Utah. But it's interesting you say that because as I sat down with one of the people one of the legislators that is opposing my pilot. And she said, um, she said, I'm okay with people with disabilities using it, but I don't think it should be available to other people. And my reply to her was, why do you think a person with a disability has more right to vote than a single mother who can't get off work while the polls are open? Right. Right, yeah. like, and, and that's yeah. kind of what you're saying. Um, in fact, I get asked all, all the time, especially when I'm doing news, when I'm doing um, news interviews, 
and th they ask me, they say, okay, well, you can use this for people with disabilities. How do you define a disability? And it's funny because I've never heard you say that, but the answer that I give people is, I rely on people to tell me if they have a disability. And right. if they tell me they do, I don't ask them what it is, I trust them. So Amelia, there's another aspect that I think you'll find interesting that we're that we're looking at. And that is that, that um, um, segregated voting is inherently discriminatory. And this becomes a civil right, not just a disability right. Mm -hmm. And there's really an uncomfortable parallel between uh, not you and not now, uh, which was the excuse in the early days of the civil rights. And those are very similar arguments. It's the separate but equal. Mm -hmm. and all, of the dis all of the civil rights organizations have been fighting against the separate but equal notion. So to frame this as a civil rights issue and a personal decision are two pretty powerful concepts that we're trying to get across. Right. So uh, what, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons why I think I have a, a very different take on this is uh, my background. I grew up for, uh, for, a, a, for a large part of my childhood, we had housing insecurity. Uh, my mother is disabled. And when I was just an infant, um, she left an abusive husband, my father, and she had five children. So I'm the youngest of five children with a single disabled mother. And there were, like I said, several years of my life that we had housing insecurity where at times we were homeless, at times we lived in a motel, at times we lived on the couch at a friend's house. Um, and there was a period of time that we, we were moving multiple times a year. And when that happens, as, as an election official, when I look back on that, um, anyone in that situation, anyone who's in the situation that my mother was in, I want them to have a right to vote. And I don't see any of these excuses or these concerns as a viable reason to take away someone's right to vote. And maybe it's because I grew up seeing it. But Larry and Amelia, can I can I ask you a question and, uh, about this? And it, it kind of relates it relates directly to blockchain. We just finished a uh, a panel before this one on decentralized identity, mm -hmm. and I, I have two questions. Uh, actually, one for you, Larry. One for you, Amelia. Larry, with regard to a decentralized identity, what what are your thoughts about? Uh, if if people do have some kind of decentralized identity, and I, I don't know how much you know about this subject specifically, but if they do have a disability or something that, that gives them uh, a, a, a sort of a different set of permissions to, to vote, whether it's some kind of remote or mail-in or, or whatever, what do you think about the concept of having decentralized identity play a role in that? And the question to you, Amelia, is as an elections official, how do you do what you just talked about doing is making sure somebody that has ha um, housing insecurity, how do you make sure that that person has a right to vote, but yet at the same time, make sure that that person doesn't vote or somebody doesn't use that person's identity to vote in multiple elections. So, um, so Larry, the, the identity question in terms of a, dis a, a disability as a, as a, credential, so to speak, in the decentralized identity, and then the, the issue of housing insecurity. Yeah, I think, um, so to, to pick up on a thread that Eugene started on, hold on one second, um, is that this is going to be a journey. Uh, in the United States, um, as distinct from, say, uh, Estonia, um, they're really there, there's going to be very strong headwinds toward uh, in this topic of identity, uh, whether it's decentralized or centralized. Um, and um, but I, I do believe that it is one of the central topics of election reform that has to occur. I mean, what we're seeing already is um, the early stages of legislation. Larry, you got a little bit quiet. Can you? I don't know if you accidentally covered your microphone or something, but you kind of went quiet a little bit. That's worse. Now you want silent. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're you're completely you're not muted, but we can't hear you. I think that's better. Is that better? A little, better. Can, a little better. A little better. Just get head in the right direction. Just um, make sure you project your voice a little bit, and I think we'll be fine. Well, I'm speaking right into a. Uh, there you go. Good... We can hear you now. Okay. That's better. Okay. Um, let me get back on video. Um, so, just to repeat for just to sort of pick up my thread, is that identity is going to be the um, one of the the great topics that need to be uh, researched and the advocacy position that we're trying to get think about deeply is we need to begin a process of of um, requirements gathering testing and and eventually a national certification program uh, we will always be in a in an endless loop uh, if we're conducting ourselves as we do now uh, we need a standard that we test against that evolves as we learn more and uh, it will be through that iterative process that, that we will make progress. And we need to start it on all fronts. And blockchain technology is gonna be, I believe, critical to not only protecting the vote, but protecting the voter registration file. And that's where the intersection of identity and voting occurs. Yeah. I think that was a great way to, to tee that up for us, Larry. Um, I think one of the interesting things in technology and voting um, is that the weakest link in our election system is not actually the transfer of the vote. When we talk about electronic voting and when we talk about utilizing blockchain to secure an electronic vote, the biggest thing that everybody talks about, and in fact, this really shows why I feel that some of these cybersecurity experts truly don't understand elections. Um, for example, this MIT report talking about how bad blockchain is voting, every one of these critics hyper-focus on the transfer of the vote. They're talking about the transfer of the actual choice. And the irony of that is that the most insecure part of our election system is exactly what you're talking about, Gerard. It's the identity piece. It's the voter registration database and the identity. If you wanna look at our current election system, the most attacked part of the election system from a nation state cybersecurity standpoint is not actually the tabulation. The most attacked part of our system and the most vulnerable part of our system is the voter registration database and the process of identifying voters. And so um, this is one reason why as an election official, I take these reports from whether it be, you know, MIT or verified voting or another one of our critics. And I take them all with a grain of salt because their naivety in how elections actually happen is shown in the fact that they're so concerned with the actual transfer of the vote. And that's the easy part to secure. The identity and the voter registration database is by far the most problematic part. But this is where technology can bring us the most help. Um, I know that there's, as we develop this part of it, um, I think there's a huge opportunity for blockchain in the voter registration database. And that's the part of the election system that I don't know of a single vendor who's currently utilizing blockchain in the voter registration database right now. Um, I've, I'm in talks of working with my print vendor to utilize blockchain technology to secure the voter list with them. But the actual database that is housed in the United States, it's housed by each different secretary of state or lieutenant governor's office. Um, that is where I would love to see blockchain implemented in the voting process and secured. And then the yeah. other part of that is whatever solution we have, there has to be interoperability with that database, with the tabulation and election vendors and ballot creators. And I believe there needs to be interoperability with forward looking technologies. If we get to the point that we have a self-sovereign identity, we need a system that will be interoperable with that self-sovereign identity. Um, and then there's a myriad of identity requirements globally as far as identifying yourself and being a valid registered voter. So you really, I think we'd, we could almost do a whole nother session 
on just that, Gerard. Uh, yeah, I, I think we need to. I think we should, because yeah. I think that that is an emerging area and there's currently no one playing in that space, but it's- So let me make an official announcement and thanks Susan Eustace for the fact that we're gonna be doing a series on, uh, on voters, I'm not uh, on voting in elections, uh, election systems, um, because I think that we need to take target a different topic almost every month, like identity, voter roles, right. Uh, the, you know, the, the chain of custody of votes, right? I mean, I, you know, we, we should really do um, during the blockchain week in May that that crossing our fingers is still happening in May in, at the Capitol in DC. Um, I'm wondering if we shouldn't just do a series on voting instead of just doing a panel, but the week leading up to that, if we do a series and we do, you know, one on identity and one on voter registration and one on transfer of votes. And, you know, I, it, we could almost do an entire series on elections and blockchain yeah. internationally while it I totally happen. agree so let, let's have let's talk about that at, at our next voter uh, uh, voting working group call we can we can flesh yeah. that out I, I just want to highlight it's uh, we have about 45 minutes right we still need to get uh, we need to get to Nimit we need to get to Giles and then we want to uh, wrap up with Susan and talk about standards and stuff like that so right so um, you know what? let's move on to, to uh, do you want to go Nimit or Giles next Let's do let's do Giles. Giles is in Paris, and it's it's a little bit later there. Uh, Giles, what time is it where is you that are? Okay for you, Nimit. Does that work for you? I'm just give me a thumbs yeah. up. I can see on the screen. Are you okay. All right. Absolutely. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, and hold on. So let me let me make sure that he can um, unmute himself. Yeah. So Giles, can you unmute yourself? No, not yet. Let's let's it's see if I can. If that doesn't work for him, we can have Nimit go. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, he figured. Oh, there you go, Giles. I see you've unmuted. Hey, great. Thanks. Um, yes. So, so thanks, and, and Amelia um, for, for, for hosting me. Um, maybe let, let me introduce Electis because I think we're a little bit of a different animal or, you know, organization than, than, than everyone else uh, here on the table. Um, Electis, you know, we created a, a little bit more than a year ago. What we are is, is a do tank and it's a nonprofit do tank. Um, and, and I guess, you know, why, you know, we, 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 we got fascinated, my co-founder and myself, my co-founder comes from the startup world, I come from the institutional world, I was a civil servant, I was an advisor to different ministers, to President Sarkozy, um, and, and we, we realized that, you know, what was missing in this whole debate, or I mean, what we could be useful for, is, is, is the pragmatic approach, you know? Um, when I was listening about the debate around the MIT paper and, and, you know, and, and, and how we can respond to that, I mean, there is of course a technical discussion, but at the end of the day, and I think Larry uh, made it clear when he was talking about trust, you know, um, is how people feel about these different uh, voting instruments. And what we thought is, you know, together with all the people who are developing solutions, you know, here we have, we have votes and clear ballot and, and people who are really implementing them, them as you are, Amelia, how can we have a place where everyone gathers in a, you know, in a, in a very nonprofit manner and just test all these solutions and see what does work, what doesn't work, how can we, you know, better it, uh, what is best for which kind of usage because maybe they're not one size fits all solution. Mm -hmm. We're talking about blockchain, you know, uh, Larry, you were saying there's security related issues and there's policy related issues. And I think blockchain certainly has a lot of say on, on, on security and accessibility, and there's technical answers to that. But there's also at the end of the day, a policy answer to that. I think there's something very rich in, in, in blockchain. It's the fact that it's decentralized. And I think this has a huge impact on people's reaction. Uh, Amelia, you started saying like 2020 was you know, a catalyst year for voting. And, and because of course the US election showed uh, how much there is to, you know, to, 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 to renovate in our systems. But I think in 2020, there's something else which happened, which is all these grassroots movements we saw around the world, you know, and there's been Friday for Future and there's been Black Lives Matter and there's been all these youth movements and group movements everywhere. And what it shows is, you know, there's, an intern catalyst, the system is itself, you know, questioning itself, and there's an outside catalyst. And, and people are not really trusting the system anymore. So blockchain there is very powerful. Um, and so what we're trying to do with Electis is, is to have that, that, that horizontal approach, which is embedded in blockchain itself. You know, if we're building solutions 
let's build them in a horizontal manner, in a decentralized manner, the same way that blockchain itself is built. And that's what we're trying to do with LFT. So happy, you know, happy to elaborate more, uh, happy to have anyone here on the, on the chat, you know, to, to, to join us and, you know, and, 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 and be part of the community because I think we need to be decentralized and horizontal if we want to build something that's going to be trusted by people. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think that the, in the past, people just trusted that the government entity counting the votes was valid. But I think Giles, you made a great point. Globally, people have lost trust in the system. Um, I think the I think the 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 COVID situation has really accentuated that. You have the number of people. I think prior, like January of this year, I think if you took a survey of people, do you trust what the World Health Organization tells you? You would have a high percentage of people who said that. And now that is a significantly lower amount of people just because they are seeing information changing constantly. Plus, like you say, that I think the everything from the World Health Organization to whoever counts our votes to just like you say, with the Black Lives Matter, with the criminal justice system, there's a lot of distrust in the system. And I think, um, I think you, you really did a, a good job of outlining that there needs to be that transparency and that ability. And I think elections is, is a great place for yeah. that. And, and if I can bounce back on that, Amelia, I mean, because this leads to two things. It leads at people questioning the system itself. You know, you, 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 you can even have, you can have the best audited system. You know, um, in Estonia, there's an electronic system which is, which is centralized and, you know, fully audited. But if you would ask Estonia to run the same system with voters in Russia, you know, and it will be just the two people deciding on the front on, on, on the frontier, then of course there'll be distrust, even if it's fully audited and exposed and everything. And at the other, at the same time, these movements, these grassroots movements, they are working on their own new electoral tools because they want to be more legitimate. So mm -hmm. you have these two pressure at the same time. And I think, you know, we can look at the threat and saying like, oh my God, you know, the whole system is going to collapse soon. Or you can look at it in a positive way saying like, wow, there's all this energy around how, you know, how, how you legitimate power and how you get into politics. And I think that's the bet we want to do with electives, you know, bet on these people who want to build a new kind of trust. And I think we should, you know, accompany that movement. Right. I think that's a great point. I think the, the human spirit has always prevailed, right? We've, 10,000 years, we've always prevailed. And I think that you're right. That's what I think that it's a more sure bet that we bet on the human spirit than we just bet on complete, complete, complete collapse. I love that. I think that's a, I think that's a great way to put it. Um, and you actually talked, you actually mentioned something that I, I think we haven't even talked about. And you talked about how some of these organizations are looking for their own voting solutions so they can become more legitimate. Um, we, we've been talking about government elections this whole time, but there's a whole space on elections that is outside of government, right? There's an entire space of elections that is organizational elections. So that's something that maybe Gerard, we should consider for the future or for other topics as well, is outside of government, there are trade associations, unions, standards organizations, grassroots movements, all of those have a need for elections and for these grassroots movements to have validity and security. I think that's a, I think that's a great point, Giles. If I can but take one example, that, you know, to see, that, to see how, I mean, very small, I very short point, you know, go, go for, it. for example, we're working with, you know, at the COP26, which is the big, you know, assembly on, on climate change and only governments are there, you know, to represent people. Now we're working with the UN and Yongo. Yongo is the youth NGO, for, for, for climate change. So it's, it's, it's the, it's the uh, parent NGO for all the youth NGOs on climate change. We're helping them to elect their representatives in a democratic manner, because then the day they arrive at the table of, of, of the governments at the COP26, and they can claim, look, you know, we've been elected in a transparent e-voting system. So we're as representative as you are, you know, uh, you governments. And this is going to be very powerful. So I think I think there's a lot of places in the world where you would see these you, these organizations looking for for new standards. 
I think that's a great point. Thank you, Giles. I think, Gerard, should we move on to the next part and we'll have Nimit talk about one of the actual solutions that we have on the market yeah, today? I think, Giles, I mean, it's a great way to pivot because I know what, uh, in speaking to some of the folks that uh, votes, well, primarily Philip, um, Nimit and their solution uh, have all kinds of different solutions for all kinds of organizations, and they've done stuff in, in both the government world, but their, their solution actually uh, works for all kinds of organizations. And so, Nimit, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, about the votes product, the votes application, how it can be used, maybe you know, you know, some of the places where it has been used. Um, but, but you guys have an actual solution. Please tell us about it. So, just, can Nimit unmute himself? Um, he says no. Yes, he can un unmute himself. Can you now? Let me see if I, maybe I'll try to unmute you if you can't. And I am, all right. So I'm trying to unmute you, but I think you have to unmute yourself. Okay, there there you we go. go. Thank you, thank you. Well, I'll, maybe I'll introduce you real quick. Nimit is um, the founder of Votes, that's V-O-A-T-Z. They are a current blockchain voting solution that is on the market and have been active in US federal elections since 2018. So you've got two years under your belt. And full disclosure, I am a customer of votes. They are the blockchain voting solution that I have utilized in the last five elections here in my county. So Nimit. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Gerard, for having us here. Um, yeah, so Gerard, to answer your question, yes, the system we have has been used by governments, as, as you already know, but also by both the major political parties in multiple states uh, to conduct their internal elections, voting at the conventions, committee meetings, etc., as well as universities, uh, unions, nonprofits as well. We actually started working in the non-government space and we did nearly 35 or more than 35 elections before we did our first governmental election. And the reason that was very helpful for us was to uh, try out the platform, obviously, in a lower risk scenario, get a lot of feedback and, you know, constantly iterate and improve the system. And then once we started working with governments, we unfortunately had to step away from serving a lot of those markets. So while we do work with a handful of uh, universities and uh, nonprofits right now, our main work is focused on governments and the political parties, just because as a small company, we don't have more bandwidth than that. Um, but we, we do support them and continue to support our existing customers. And it's the same product which works. It's the same mobile app. Uh, we do have different approaches to verification. So for the government elections, it's the, the most strict form of verification where you have to verify your mobile email, then your identity by scanning a government issued photo ID, and then also taking a selfie where it does a biometric verification and then maps the data back to the voter registration system. So uh, way more strict than what a university might require. A university uh, students just want a, you know, ID or a password or just a key. So depending on the nature of the election, you can, you know, dial up the security or, or dial down the security. And then also the other really configurable part of the system, uh, which can be configured on a per election basis, is whether you want to generate paper ballots or not. So as, as you may know, in the US, tabulation happens with paper ballots. There's no real, you know, non-paper based digital tabulation. And so for that reason, even though on our system you're voting on the phone, it actually produces a, a paper ballot at the jurisdiction's end, which is then tabulated with the rest of the paper ballots, which have you know, either arrived by mail or may have been submitted by in-person voting. But in elections in other countries, uh, so we've just done uh, a small pilot in Brazil where the government does not require paper ballots at all. And right now in the midst of uh, our biggest ever election, 
uh, with the interim government of Venezuela, there as well, no, no paper ballots are required. So it varies from country to country, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. The US does seem to have a, a little bit of an obsession with paper ballots right now. <laughs> but other countries, some of the bigger uh, democracies like India and Brazil have given up paper ballots long ago and are never going to come back because it is not a solution which scales for you know 800 million people voting. There's no way to secure a system which is based on paper. So um, that's kind of a little overview. And I definitely want to share a little bit about our current election, which is happening, as I said. It's currently happening, start this Monday, and goes till Saturday evening. It's the biggest ever election we've ever done. It is organized by the uh, government of uh, the interim president in Venezuela, uh, Juan Guaido. So obviously he's running against the, the Maduro government, which has been largely de-recognized by most countries around the world. And so they're running a national, uh, it's actually an international campaign where any Venezuelan citizen can vote on three questions. So it's a, it's a plebiscite, it's a referendum. And the requirement there is to use a, a national ID. So everybody does have to scan a national ID um, to, to vote. So I'll post the link if you wanna read about it. Um, it's available here. And one of the really in, uh, interesting things, um, sorry if I'm sounding jaded right now, but we've been playing board games this week. Uh, as you might imagine, the system's been uh, constantly attacked since uh, since last weekend. And so we, with every attack, we are deflecting the attack, you know, finding uh, uh, workarounds. So one of the things they started to do was block incoming SMS in Venezuela from, from the US. And so we rerouted traffic from Brazil, from the UK. Uh, similarly, they've tried to block, uh, block access to the, to the servers. So we've been using approaches through random DNS to, to block those attacks. In addition, voters are using VPNs to bypass in-country censorship, in-country restriction. And so far, um, more than half a million people have voted across different uh, channels. So it's a fascinating project. It's the most complex project we think uh, um, has ever been done, uh, at least by us and perhaps other people as well. So we'll definitely have more to share about it once it's over, uh, but you can read about it on the link I just posted on chat and happy to answer any, any questions. So I think I'll pause there, Amelia and Gerard, unless you wanna want me to talk about something else. Yeah, let me let me just ask you one one question and then I, um, I know Amelia knows you a lot closer than I do. I, I'm fascinated by, by this. When you engage with, with folks in government, do, well, so let me just share a story. I was, I was in Cameroon, we were invited to, uh, to Cameroon to, uh, they were having a re rebellion and the rebellion had launched an ICO, right? And they were, they asked us to come and give them advice about how they should respond because the, the rebellion forces were using the funds from the ICO to fund their, their hot war. Uh, but we had a conversation with the ICT minister, Internet Communications and Technology, who, who reports to the, to the president. And she said to me, we're interested in blockchain in, in all of its use cases, except for elections. Our elections work just the way we like them to, right? He had been the president at that point, I don't know, for 30, 40, 50 years, right? So he, he wins every election in a, in, a, in a democratically elected cycle. And so my, my question to you is, when you engage with public officials, do they really want transparency? Do they really want... Uh, the kinds of things that blockchain offers, or or um, or is do they want to maintain some kind of control and some kind of uh, limited access? What what kind of conversations are you having with folks in government uh, about the about the characteristics of blockchain based voting? That's a, that's a great question. I don't think I can 
I can generalize the answer. I think it depends uh, depends and varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. There are some very forward-looking election officials. Amelia is, is a pioneer. Uh, Secretary of State uh, Mac Warner from West Virginia is a pioneer. And so they definitely want, want to make change. And it's, it's not and that desire to make change is not coming from any kind of you know, personal motivation. Um, at the same time, there are election officials who don't want to change as you described because um, there's risk involved in any kind of change. And um, you have to go from a comfortable situation to a uncomfortable situation where you may have to answer questions from the press, from officials as to why are you adopting something new, uh, which is you know potentially criticized or um, there are people who never want that change to happen. So it does require, in a, in a sense, uh, a leap of faith. And our, when we talk to election officials, um, our pitch to them is in a couple of fronts. One is um, efficiency and the other ones is access. So as Amelia mentioned earlier, there are millions, and Larry too, and he, he probably knows more about this. There are millions of disabled people who don't vote because they can't vote with the traditional method. And so while it's great that, you know, 150 million people voted in this election cycle, there are still a few million people with disabilities who wanted to vote, but couldn't vote because there was no accessible way for them to vote. There were voters from the Native American tribes who, who didn't vote because there was there's no mail, the nearest in-person voting station is miles away. They have really, you know, they don't have good, you know, communicate or transportation services, but they do have a very good cellular network. And so if we can get them a mobile approach, a bunch of those people would have managed to vote, but we kind of ignore them in the conversation. And I think it's about time they, they don't get ignored because they are equal citizens and they deserve the right to vote as well. So I think that's that's a that's a very good pitch. It's a very strong pitch, and election officials like Amelia, like Secretary Warner, who care about improving access, get that instantly because they've been in situations where they can easily relate to that. So I think that's one approach. The other approach is efficiency and and cost. I think Amelia can you know share practical examples. This past election cycle, we got the most number of uh, votes ever in Utah County in, in, a, in one of the, in the, all the five elections we've done and had those come through email, you would have had to reproduce each of those nearly 900 ballots by hand, which would have taken hours here, just print scan and you're done in a, you know, fraction of that time. So it might, just look at the efficiency you would save, uh, the, the time and money you would save doing, doing something which is you know digital, auditable, versus manual reproduction where you are prone to, to errors and you know other other challenges as well. Yeah. So, I think those those are key things. Uh, access. How do you make equitable access for everybody? And two is efficiency, which you know invariably uh, brings it down to cost. And I would, I would challenge if we if we did a thorough analysis, this election cycle in the US, we probably spent more than $2 billion just conducting the election, not including the, the political campaigns, which were way, lot, way more than that. And if, if we were to adopt a more efficient technology first system, we can potentially save 75% of that cost which would make states self-reliant, not dependent on federal government, every election cycle to fund the elections, and you know, create that sustainable process where they can innovate and you know, use that money for innovation and improving security and processes rather than just using it to do the same thing again and again, which we know is not the most efficient way to do it. Yeah, thank you, Nima. I think that was fantastic. I, um, I think one of the, one of the key features of, of you and your product 
is your desire for interoperability, not only with other technologies, but even with antiquated processes. Like you said, election administrators like myself don't tend to like to innovate. And so the more that you can integrate your solution into existing processes, um, like you said, in, in the United States, we have a fascination with paper ballots. And so um, your company has been very willing to be interoperable with our archaic needs, I suppose you could say, and find a way to take that blockchain solution to produce a paper ballot, as opposed to areas like Estonia, who've been using online voting for years, and where that paper ballot is not necessary, uh, your product also is interoperable with them. So I think it's a great product to talk about because you utilize a blockchain solution to ensure the vote, regardless of whether the jurisdiction needs a paper ballot or doesn't. So I think that's a great, a great approach to it. Um, did we, let's see, um, Gerard, it looks like we're getting fairly short on time. Um, yeah, maybe I'm I'll just really quickly summarize some of the pilots that I'm working on. Um, I was gonna take 15 minutes, but I'll bet I can do it in less than five and then we can move on to the next part. Um, as Nimit said, we've been working with him um, on pilot projects over the last several years. I took office in 2019, so I'm only about two years in office. And we've done five elections with blockchain technology. We, uh, our first one was a, a municipal, meaning a city primary in 2019. And we only used the blockchain voting for the overseas and military members at that time. Only people serving in the US Armed Forces or living overseas or their families could vote on it. And then in November of 2019, we added anyone with disabilities to that. In March of 2020, we did the US presidential primary. And once again, it was overseas and military and disabled voters. In June of 2020, I was able to expand that use to caretakers of anybody with a disability as well. I think Larry mentioned that. So I was able to go with not only the, now we had two domestic populations, those with disabilities and caretakers of those with disabilities. And then in November of this year, I added an, an emergency component to that. Anyone who had been quarantined um, or tested positive for COVID that couldn't make it to the polls, we added them as well. We ended up with eight, we call those emergency ballots. And we ended up with 87 people in my county who did that. So we've been running these pilots and they've been going very successfully. Because of the use of blockchain technology, we've been able to audit 100% of those votes. Um, if you look at, we had 292,000 votes cast in my county. We found about 291,000 of those to be valid votes that, we could be, that could be counted. And of that, we performed a risk limiting audit of 1,000 of those votes. So we did, about a third of a percent. We audited about one third of 1% of our paper ballots to ensure the integrity of our election. But if you look at our pilot project, we audit 100% of those votes. And that's possible because of the use of blockchain technology. So that as we look at e-voting solutions, blockchain enables us to inherently add security to that process. Well, what I'm currently in the process of trying to do is for 2021, we're looking to allow cities to opt in to allowing mobile voting for any citizen who wants it. And then we would have the citizens opt in. So it's a, it's a double opt-in process. A city would opt to utilize a mobile voting option. Um, it wouldn't be the only way to vote. They would still have polling locations and I am a vote by mail county, so we would still send their registered active voters a ballot in the mail. But citizens in that county could opt to utilize their phone to vote. And this would be the first time in the United States that a citizen would have no restrictions on being able to utilize a mobile voting platform. The only thing they would have to do is choose to opt in. The reason I think that this is really important is because right now, the United States does not have a, a viable contingency plan. 
So if there is an earthquake or a wildfire or a hurricane or a flood, and you have a large percentage of your population that is displaced, the United States does not have any viable backup plan for that election. And people are just no longer accepting that. COVID-19 globally has shown people that we can pivot. In business, we've pivoted, we've pivoted to Zoom, just like this panel that we're on right now. In the past, people got together for business and for groups and for collaboration. And now they utilize technology to do that. They're doing that for banking. People are currently buying homes, doing their business and managing their, ma their money and their livelihoods utilizing technology and society no longer accepts that because of an earthquake or a flood or a pandemic that we can't vote. So they're demanding technology. At this point, there have been no broad scale major elections that, that include tens of thousands of voters in the United States utilizing this technology. And so uh, my goal with this municipal pilot is to take a small election. I don't personally think that you're going to have nation state actors trying to hack the city council race for Vineyard, Utah. So I think this is the perfect place to start. I mean, Vineyard has 10,000 people living in it. I'm pretty sure we're not gonna get espionage from China to hack the election of Vineyard. And so it's a great place for us to start this process so that we can give viable feedback to companies like Votes. So we can give Nimit the information that he needs to continue to improve his product and create a robust product. It's the perfect place for us to look at these systems and create standards and parameters so that other incredibly inventive people like Nimit can go out there and create other solutions. So the pilot that I'm currently looking for is I'm looking for cities to opt in to utilize this for their city council and mayor elections, low stakes elections, and for individuals in those cities who maybe they understand blockchain technology and maybe they trust technology, give them the opportunity to help us create parameters that the human spirit and the innovative thought in people can work to solve. So that's really what I'm doing right now. Uh, if this pilot passes, which we're already, we've already developed the idea for the pilot. We found sponsors in our state le legislature and we've already passed through both the Senate and House committees. This bill in January, it will go to the House and Senate floor. And I think there's probably um, maybe a 60 to 70% chance, maybe a 70 to 80% chance that we get it passed. So I think we're looking pretty good. If this, if this initiative passes and I'm able to run these pilots, it will be the most comprehensive mobile voting event in United States history. So we're really looking forward to doing this. I'm looking forward to doing it so that we can give the, the people, the Nimitz of the world, the, it, the information that they need to create solutions to problems that are thousands of years old and that frankly in the 21st century, it's no longer acceptable to say, it scares me, we can't do it. Um, wow. That's you know, awesome. it's just no longer acceptable. I'm going to, I'm going to be a little bit mean for a second. I'm going to call out someone. I saw in the chat that Brandon says mobile is dangerous from a trust standpoint. My two cents. Well, you know what else is dangerous, Brandon? Disenfranchising millions of people because we're scared. That's dangerous. And I think it's time that we stop saying it's too scary. And I think it's time that we start finding a solution. Um, thank. I mean that, uh, that that's awesome. Um, and um, um, I do want to I do want to kind of pivot to uh, Susan because we've got about fifteen minutes left. Susan is the uh, is the lead for the GBA uh, uh, voting working group. She's got a long history in um, uh, in, in this in this area and. I'm wondering, Susan, if you can tell us a little bit about your background and also talk to us a little bit about what the voting working group is looking at doing and, um, uh, you know, some, some of the, the, the projects and the things that we're working on and, and potentially how people can get involved. 
And let me unmute you. I think you might have to unmute yourself. There you go. You're good. Oh, you were good. You were good. Let's try that one more time. So, uh, Susan, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, uh, Bill, Bill Elder, what, uh, why don't you uh, jump in there as well? Yeah, and while we get Susan figured out, Bill, oh, okay. can you unmute yourself. There you go. Oh, sure. Uh, yes, I okay, am. Okay, I got oh, it too. Oh, oh, go Susan, ahead, Bill. Oh, just want to say I'm Bill Elder. I'm one of the members of the GBA Voting Working Group and proud to be part of this nice effort. And just wanted to say great comments and insights by everybody so far. And I'll uh, turn it over to Susan for her overview of the voting working group. Thanks. I, I, I wanted to uh, say that a lot of people here have been wonderful keeping this working group going, but particularly Philip. Philip is, is just a rock in terms of thinking through what the issues are for voting and, and improving voting through blockchain. And Amelia, I wanted to pick up on, on what you were just saying about being people being afraid. I was afraid to put my money in the bank with a photograph of the check uh, using my cell phone to take a picture of the check. But you know what? The money went in. Can you imagine? <laughs> it right. worked. Hey, Susan, share, share, share a little bit about your background, because uh, your credentials, because we haven't we haven't properly introduced you, and I think people should know where you sure. I invented the uh, first electronic voting machine, uh, you know, and I got a lot of publicity at the time from People Magazine, and and uh, so are there any other questions as we wrap up? And we're going to be right. What's going on? I took I took care of it. Okay. <laughs> so I, I invented the first electronic voting machine. Uh, it's still in use. Uh, the code I wrote is still out there, or it wasn't me, it was a whole team of us. And the uh, people who worked on the machine with me are have proved to be very famous. Uh, Paul Horowitz and uh, Winfield Hill, who worked on the first set of designs, wrote the book, the standard book on electronics uh, at Harvard. They, and uh, Paul got to be the, the, the first, the youngest professor ever made professor. So uh, Wayne Rosing became the first CTO of um, Google after he invented the, the uh, PC for Apple and so on and so forth. So it was a really august team, but we were young and and we were interested in voting and, and we did a good job. And now I've become interested in voting again because it's very clear that then the next phase uh, of technology, the new wave is upon us and it's called smartphones and people are gonna use smartphones to vote. And, the, um, and so I've been driving the GBA to build standards so that there's a, a certification that makes sense for uh, uh, if a company goes out and builds a, a device that, and, and a, a system, an election system that works on a smartphone, that there's a place to come to where they can get a certification that's in a, and the group has integrity and, and is doing the right things. So we, we have a set of certifications out there and we think it's, it's going to be very, very useful as people develop and move forward with a new technology. Everyone has, the number of cell phones in the world is, is phenomenal. I'm an industry analyst and my colleagues uh, used to say, well, we might get 3% penetration of the cell phones. No, <laughs> we've got, you know, 115% penetration worldwide. And everybody I think I, I, I saw a statistic yesterday and it was talking about something else, but it talked about how um, like 40% of the world's population have a television set um, and 60% of the world's population has access to a, a, a laptop or a PC, but 90% yeah. of the world's population has access to a cell phone. 
I think it's higher than even that. And this makes sense. This is how people are going to, to vote. It's inevitable. Uh, the naysayers can sit out there and be naysayers, but we have to figure out how to do it right. We have to pull the right security systems in place. And as I said, Philip has been a wonderful, wonderful asset as GBA uh, tries to use blockchain uh, to, to move forward. And, and of course, everybody that's speaking is, is wonderful. Uh, but I'm here to get questions from people. What do you, what do you want to say? Bill Elder has been a terrific guy. What, but what yeah. kind of, what questions do we have? I'm here to just, I want to hear from people. Well, can, can I make a suggestion? If anybody's got questions about um, how they can participate in uh, uh, the voting working group, we're actually working on, uh, like Susan said, the, these vote standards. Uh, a number uh, of folks in the voting working group are, are working on solutions. And then I wish we just had time to, to, to talk to you about everything. We're, we're looking at uh, bundling all these solutions together in an ecosystem under the government business blockchain platform so that Lots of people can build solutions, and then those solutions are part of an ecosystem that make them more valuable. So if you uh, have any interest in wanting more information, then I would say um, go ahead and, and drop your uh, – your, your, um, uh, yeah, or, or um, yeah, drop, your question, drop your question or your email address in the, uh, in the chat. We do need to wrap this up in eight minutes. Um, Amelia, are there any sort of parting thoughts or, or questions or comments that, that you wanted to address? Yeah, um, I'm just replying in the, in the chat. Um, you know, once again, I want people to think of cybersecurity not in a vacuum. I want people to think of it in the, in the context of reality. And the reality is the way that we are currently voting, um, paper ballots, can be duplicated. Paper ballots can randomly show up in a suitcase. Mail-in ballots, it does not take, like, it does not take a lot of skill to walk down the street and pull people's ballots out of their mailbox. And as we look at voting solutions for the future, what we need to recognize is that cybersecurity does not occur in a vacuum. We need to look at the security in the realm of the spectrum that Larry was talking about. I think Larry did a really good job of outlining that security is a spectrum and we need to look at where we currently are on that spectrum with voting today. And then as we look at solutions, we need to place those solutions on that spectrum. And then we work together utilizing human ingenuity to improve security as we move along in the process. And um, blockchain has a key element in this. And that is that nothing will be 100% secure ever, whether it's paper ballots or electronic ballots. However, the ability to detect fraud is what's most important. And that's where blockchain comes in. Blockchain with the immutable record gives us the ability to see if something was changed, which gives us the ability to audit results and to do so in a transparent manner. And that I think is where we make the turn in improving elections and bringing them into the 21st century. It's blockchain is absolutely a key part of that solution. Absolutely. All right. And I just um, I just posted uh, uh, recording this event uh, and the chat will be posted uh, at the link. So if you go to the GBAglobal.org event uh, page and under view all events, uh, you will see the, uh, the, the link to, to this event. So later today, uh, I will I'll put a link. Should have, it should have the chat. It should have the recording, the, uh, the, the presentations, uh, everything. So with that, I want to thank everyone for attending. I want to thank all, all of our, uh, I, I, I can't really call them panelists. I guess they were guests. So we did this one a little differently. Um, I, the, the chat's great, um, just, uh, just phenomenal. So uh, keep your eye on the event page and please, please check out our, 
uh, the homepage gbaglobal.org. Please check out the uh, the event that we have coming up in May. We would love to see you there. We're going to have uh, leaders from around the world. Yeah, Government Blockchain Week. So thank you guys, and um, I'll leave it open for a moment or two if you guys want to 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 uh, scrape the chat. But uh, I'll be closing it down here in the next minute or two.